Hi YouTube. Today's video is on a rather controversial subject, especially considering how white I am. <laughs> Today's video is on the subject of racism in the Jehovah's Witness congregations. Now, it's very easy to think that the witnesses actually have it right when it comes to racism, especially if you are not intimately familiar with how they work. Um, or if you've only read what they have to say about the subject on JW.org. Their articles about race sound downright reasonable. But it doesn't take a whole lot of digging through the old publications to come across some pretty damn racist stuff. Like the idea that black people are meek and make perfect servants. That was published at one time. Or that the witnesses used to segregate congregations. Um, and they did. Or that Jehovah was going to make everyone white in the new system. At one point, they actually taught that too. Now, this was all before my time, of course. But looking back, um, even to the time when I was a child, I sometimes cringe at the things that I obliviously believed and thought and said. But the, the bottom line was that we, in our minds, were not racist because we let black people go to the kingdom hall with us. I mean, we had no clue what racism was, much less any concept of white privilege or systemic racism. Now, I grew up in the Carolinas, was born in North Carolina, and um, spent most of my childhood in South Carolina. But um, basically, my mom told us that prejudice was bad and that, it was that black people who didn't like white people were racist too. Um, um, but I think that many people in the South lack understanding of what these terms actually mean. And we think that because we're not active members of the KKK and we don't use the N-word regularly, that we're not racist. I mean, sure, we, we might laugh at um, N-word jokes now. I can't really bring myself to say that word. <laughs> um, I, it's the most offensive word there is. Say that word. Um, but we, we would tell those jokes. But um, that's just because they were funny. I mean, we weren't being mean. <laughs> we even had black friends. I'll get to that in a minute. But for us, I mean, it really was a black or white thing because those were literally the only races. I mean, there were a few Hispanics when I was growing up, but... They were really kind of considered white, to be honest. And there weren't any Asians that I knew of, really. I mean, um, I'm sure that that was very different in other areas of the U.S. and the world. But anyway, before I go on into the real um, Jehovah's witness -y part of this, I, I, I kind of want to talk about what privilege is. Because I know that it was a hard concept for me to grasp. And I think there's so many people in the world who don't get it, who don't know what it is. And a lot of white people, we have a hard time listening when black people talk to us. And so maybe sometimes we kind of need a this kind of face to, 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 to tell growing us. Up in, um, growing up not rich in the South, um, the word privilege to us meant wealth. And though the majority of my family emphatically did not come from wealth, with the exception being my maternal grandfather, who left behind an incredibly wealthy extended family to be a Jehovah's Witness, I have no idea why. They were lovely people. In fact, um, we're pretty much hillbillies on both sides, except for grandfather. Uh -huh. If you go far enough back, we have some pretty fancy ancestry. In fact, 23andMe tells me that between four and seven generations ago, I had a full-blooded West African... Um, ancestor I would never have get I would never guess I'm looking at myself but really that's so cool um, but you got to go pretty far to find find that ancestry so so back in the day if, if someone said the words white privilege to me my defenses would immediately go up because number one I did not grow up wealthy and number two I like black people for crying out loud I really do I always have but that's not what white privilege means it means, in a nutshell, that if all other factors are equal, if a white person and a black person are interviewing for the same job, the white person is more likely to be hired. Statistics show that white people are more likely to get paid more money for the same jobs. We get more raises, more attention, more credit, just more. 
And it's not, it, it's not because we're assholes or because we are intentionally racist jerks. Because I don't think the great, I mean, those people exist, but the great majority of us are not. It's because this is part of our society to the point that we have this privilege and we are complicit in this system whether we want to or not. We don't get a choice. None of us do. It's not like we can opt out, right? But I firmly believe that race is still as much an issue in American society as it ever was. And it is getting better, but, but it's such an agonizingly slow rate. I don't understand it. We are nowhere near as far along as we thought we were, even though we've made some progress as a nation since I was a kid. I also firmly believe that white people, we need to engage if we ever hope to speed up the pace of change. And we should. See, privilege is the ability to ignore the issue. But we shouldn't do that. We can't do that if we actually give a shit. Because y'all, racism isn't just a black issue or Hispanic issue or an Asian issue. It's a humanity issue. And at least in America, white people, we started this crap. We have a responsibility that we have woefully neglected. We should be looking at it. We should be talking about it, learning about it, acknowledging it. It does not mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It means that we have to recognize the fact that we get benefits from our society that we have not earned and other people suffer for it okay so if you're interested in learning more about this I'm gonna post some links in the description um, one of them is an article on understanding white privilege um, one of them is a very famous piece called unpacking the invisible knapsack um, one is a Huffington Post article about explaining white privilege to a broke white person. And then there's, a, there's, um, two reading lists. One of them is 16 books about race that white people should read. I have not read all of them, but I have read some. And, um, the ones I have read thus far are amazing. And finally, Understanding and Dismantling Racism, it's a book list for white readers. And it's basically about how you can start changing this. Um, so, so that's a really long digression. <laughs> it's not particularly witness related, but I do think it's very important. And um, so now I'll jump off that soapbox and get on to my personal thoughts and experiences with racism in the witness congregations. So when I was very small, the only black people in our congregation were a couple from up north who eventually became witness missionaries in Africa, where they have been for over 35 years now. Um, but at that time, we were very curious about them. Because my parents had all grown up in North Carolina, um, and we saw and knew of black people, but we didn't know them know them. I mean, um, these two people were an anomaly when they showed up. <laughs> So, of course, we asked them rude questions, and we touched their hair without asking. Because um, then their people are different, and different funny. <laughs> we were generally obnoxious in the most innocent way because we had no idea that we were being offensive. But we actually did all become friends, and my mother still stays in touch with that couple to this day. I mean, they're very dear friends. Um, but they just we just didn't get it, and I was little, and thought that this was all normal. This yeah. was My mom did not do a great job explaining things to me as a kid. Um, <laughs> big surprise. But when I heard someone say the N-word one time, and I asked her, what does that mean? She told me that it was just a southern accent, and it was just somebody saying the word Negro with a southern accent, and Negro is the word for black people. Now, <laughs> Imagine the consternation that happened during the, uh, you know, the, the reading exercise. I pronounced the printed word Negro in a different way. <laughs> now, I had, I had black friends in that class, um, and I remember their faces in that reading circle when that word came out of my mouth, and it was my first hard reality check. There was one little girl in particular that I used to play with on the playground. Her name was Kizzy, and... Man, she jumped up. She was about to take me out. Luckily, the teacher intervened, and I remember her saying to me, that is not a nice word. Don't ever say it again. 
and I was like, whoa, uh, it's just like, why? I mean, my, my mama told me that it was just an accent thing. Like, you know, Yankees say the and we say the. And so my teacher very gently explained to me that that was not, in fact, the case. And detailed in an age-appropriate way why, um, how and why it was so offensive. And I was horrified, mortified. I wanted to die. And Kizzy, I'm really sorry, Kizzy, I'm still sorry, um, she never played with me again, even though I was abjectly sorry. Looking back, I can't really blame her, but, um, wow, talk about a life lesson. And, yeah, don't lie to your kids, guys, it's a bad idea. A little bit later, um, I developed my first crush on a boy in our congregation. So, he was just really cool and really cute, and I liked him, and, and I was still pretty little. I mean, it was after the, the, the first grade reading debacle, but um, not too much after. I was, I was little. Um, now, my sister at the time, she's five years older than me. She was all about boys, so naturally, so was I. But this boy, Mike, and my best friend, cousin, and I were like the three musketeers. Me and these two little boys, we rode golf like go karts together we played in the woods we ran around the kingdom hall after the meetings well one night at a family get together over at one of my aunt's house um my sister was talking to my aunt about the boys that she liked at the kingdom hall and wanting to be nice and include me my aunt asked me if there were any boys that i liked and so of course i piped up with, like i like mike and there was this sudden like <gasps> silence and she said you can't like him he's black <gasps> like i love the way they say it too it's like he's black like it's a secret <laughs> it's crazy everybody got a good laugh out of it actually but i was kind of shocked and really pretty sad um and it was the first time that i was like oh so there's limits on who i can like and be friends with um or even think is attractive and I really did like him. I liked him for a long time, but I never, ever said another word about it. And I never even considered dating a black person again until well after I left the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm, I'm not at all proud of that, but it is what it is. So still later, my mother actually struck up a friendship with a black sister who was also a single parent in the congregation. Um, it was a different congregation. And when we moved away to another state, my mom invited this lady to come visit us and she did come, but to our surprise, she showed up with her own sheets and towels and food in Tupperware. And we were sort of like, why? You and so have. this friend said that she had never spent the night at a white person's house. And she'd always been told that white people were nasty and that we didn't clean up our houses. And um, they were both kind of gobsmacked by the reality of each other at all. I mean, it was, it was a good visit. And... The next time she came, she left the linens in the Tupperware at home. And I think that both she and my mother and me, by extension, kind of learned more about other people um, from that experience. But it wasn't actually until the mid-90s for us in South Carolina, at least where I was, that um, interracial relationships actually became widely accepted, um, at least among the witnesses. I mean, they... They happened, and you would see the occasional interracial couple, but there were always kind of some eyebrows about it. Yeah. Like, oh, really? Um, and I think it became more normal in part because the candidate pool for eligible bachelors was just so small. I mean, oh, there were there was nobody, and so if you limited the limited already limited candidate pool by saying you're only going to date within your own race, then you're going to just be old and an old maid or whatever because nobody um, now my mom kind of really confuses me and surprises me when it comes to the race the issue she really did go out of her way to invite the poorest um, and least likely to be included people in our congregation which mostly meant black families she was the um, person cooking lunch for this circuit overseer she always invite them and she actually made plans to go out in service with the black sisters and brothers, which was something that none of the other white sisters did. Um, so she was something of a conundrum. As I recall it, I mean, her idea of beauty was a skinny white woman, full stop. But 
she actually tried to be inclusive in a way that I don't feel like anyone else in our congregation did. Um, and it was genuine. It wasn't a, hey, look at me, I'm great kind of thing, because it would have been obvious with her if it was. Um, she actually did care, and she loved these people as individuals, and she wanted to spend time with them, and I think that that's really cool. Um, there were many times during my childhood in South Carolina that we got invited to weddings or, or gatherings and stuff where um, we ended up being the only white people there. And sometimes the people seemed surprised that we actually showed up, but it was really, it was always fun and um, it was very cool and it gave me a perspective that I think I was very lucky to have. Then when I was about 16 years old, those first, I mean, the first friends that I talked about that moved into our congregation when I was very small, um, who are now missionaries in Tanzania, invited us to come over there and visit. And so we did. And I got to spend several weeks in Africa, and that was pretty life-changing. I mean, I thought growing up in the South that I knew pretty much everything there was to know about racism, um, race in general. But that trip pretty much shattered every idea I had, conscious or unconscious, about race. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in South Carolina, we had the Confederate, Confederate flag at the State House. We had the people that went around waving awful. the flag. It was really awful. Teams. But there were those people, you know. But and, and we knew that there was still KKK active in our community. We knew that. But those were the crazy people, right? We knew they were there, but they weren't us. Unfortunately, those people seem to have come out of the woodwork over the past year, but that's another topic for another time. But through all these experiences, I still did not get it. I did not recognize my own privilege until after college, into my 30s, when I moved to Richmond, Virginia, and then the Trayvon Martin shooting happened, and then Ferguson blew up, and I started noticing this stuff. And, and I went to some lectures on the campus where I worked, and I started going to the discussions and talking to people about it. And it was very heavy. It was, a, it was a very heavy time. But even more heavy lately when we're talking about the issue of race um, has been my mother slip slide into dementia for me and how she's become really more racist as, as her mind slips. And I've been kind of appalled by some of the things that she said um, to and about her caretakers who are black. I mean, there, there have been several times that I've had to apologize at least once in tears for things that my mother said to these ladies. I mean, the nursing home staff has been incredibly gracious, far beyond what I would have been, I'll tell you. But it's so weird to me that someone who used to be so progressive by our standards at the time could then regress so far is very bizarre to me. I don't know, I've kind of rambled from the point here, but as far as the witnesses go, yes, there is racism, even though there is a token black person on the governing body now. It does vary greatly based on where you are, I believe, but it's definitely alive and well. You can rest assured that if this white girl from the Carolinas noticed it, it's definitely a thing. Because, you know, we don't usually have to notice it. Um, read Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. The witnesses aren't any more racist than society is in general, but they aren't any less racist either, despite what they'd have you believe.